What's up everybody, this is Butterfish Tank, and in this episode of Aquarium Science, we're going to talk about freshwater aquarium biology. To fully understand our aquariums, we do need to have a little knowledge about the biology happening in our system. When it comes to biology in our aquariums, it's pretty similar to a lake for example. However, we have a lot of things to take into consideration, because there are some things that we might not be able to do. First things first, the difference between a lake and an aquarium is that a lake is an open system. An open system is a body of water that continuously receives new water and new nutrients from other water sources. An example of an open system would be either a lake or the ocean. A lake is connected to streams that are connected to other different lakes and rivers. This way, there will constantly come new water and new nutrients like phosphates and nitrates and even small plankton and critters into the lake. This is one of the things that we cannot accomplish in an aquarium. What we have is a closed system. What this means is that we got no other water sources that are connected with our aquariums to deliver new water, new nutrients and new critters into our aquarium. The only thing that we might get a little close to doing so would be water changes, but that only exchanges old water with fresh water and does not deliver nutrient rich waters. As well as that, in a natural lake or pond, there will be different trace elements in the water that will help plants grow. For our system to run correctly, we do need to have plants. For this reason, we have to grow them correctly. To make these plants grow naturally, we do have to need to dose some sort of trace elements. This might for example be cobalt, iron or potassium. Cobalt is a great trace element for plants and will help them receive great growth rates. Iron is another great trace element that will make sure that the plants will stay healthy. Potassium is great to give your plants a decent amount of roots and a good root structure which is of course very important. In our aquariums, we don't have any birds like ducks or swans that eat plants and fish. The only things we got as natural predators are the inhabitants themselves. This can be the fish or amphibians or even large invertebrates like crabs or shrimp. This is where we will discover the food chain system. This type of biology is very important to understand if you want to make a biological balanced ecosystem. This might sound crazy to some aquarists, but if you truly dedicate yourself to do some research and choose the right inhabitants for your aquarium, you might actually be surprised how natural your tank can be in the end. If we look at a lake's natural food chain, it looks a little like this. This is an example of what a Danish lake's food chain would look like. Do note that birds are taken out of this food chain, even though they actually are a pretty important animal to a lake. This is what I like to call a reverse food chain, where the lesser inhabitants are placed first in the line and the higher and more predatory species are in the end of the line. What we see here in the start of the food chain is that the sun gives nutrients for algae to grow. Algae will then be eaten by zooplankton, like mosquito larvae for example, which after that are eaten by larger critters, like the dragonfly nymph. The nymphs will then get eaten by a smaller fish like a perch and then the perch is consumed by a large predatory fish like the mighty northern pike. <coughs> For an aquarium to be a biological ecosystem, we cannot have predatory fish that would eat all the other fish in our system, especially if it's a nano tank, because there's simply not enough room for the fish to escape. But what we can do to get someone in the top of the food chain is to keep amphibians. All amphibians are predatory animals. These animals usually prey on small fish fry and small invertebrates like snails or shrimp. However, in the wild they mostly eat slow animals like snails or worms, but in our aquarium we might be able to establish a way for them to control other animals that might breed and spread like crazy. Do know that you still have to feed your amphibians. The point is not to constantly keep the amphibians well fed by only feeding them live food from your tank, but to keep the numbers of invertebrates intact. Now what I want to show you here is the food chain that I've developed and experimented with myself. You can make your own by doing some research and by using your knowledge from this video to create an aquarium that will be balanced and natural. 
I have five different species of animals in this small 7 gallon tank. The first and the lowest in the food chain is the pond snail. This snail is pretty small and stays that way, but they breed a lot. They can infest your tank in less than a week. These snails are not without a purpose though, because they eat dead organic matter. This can be dead plants, leftover food, or even dead fish. These snails are what our aquarium is going to depend a lot on, but it's important to not have too many of them. Which is why the next species in the food chain steps in, the cherry shrimp. Cherry shrimp is another species of invertebrate that breeds like crazy. They'll make small shrimp babies every single month and will make tons of them in their lifetime. These shrimps are scavengers and will take any food that will go on the bottom, which by the way also is dead organic material. While cherry shrimp don't directly eat snails, they might eat some snail eggs that are inside their grazing area. Now, because these shrimps breed a lot, we have to take that into control as well, which is why we have gobbies. Gobbies is a great and hardy fish species that will breed like the other, a lot. They stay young for a little over a half year and can after that be moved to a larger tank where they can continue breeding. What I do is that I already have a separate tank with adult gobbies that all produces around 60 to 80 gobby fry in a month, which is quite a lot, so that gives me the opportunity to constantly stock my system with fresh newborn gobby fry. Gobbies are great because they eat algae and snails and when older, they also eat shrimp babies. However, these can easily get out of control as well, so to balance the whole system we need to have a predator that can kill some of these fish, shrimp and snails so that they always will be in control. This is why we have our amphibian inhabitant, the African dwarf frog. This is one of the most coolest and hardy amphibians you can get for aquariums. They do not reproduce as much as the other species in this food chain, however they do reproduce about every month or so if the conditions are right. However, the tadpoles of this species is very delicate beings and will not tolerate any changes in pH or KH, but it's an opportunity and you can always experiment with it by yourself. They are very fun to keep, and they keep the other inhabitants in your aquarium in control, but in a proper way. Dwarf African frogs, as I stated earlier, will not only live off of your aquarium inhabitants, but also of frozen bloodworms, krill, blackworms, or brine shrimp. The reason for this is because they are used to eating worms and unaware fish fry in the wild, so they can only catch very slow animals. For that reason, faster prey such as shrimp and fish will not be as easy of a target for these slow amphibians. But, some will get caught every now and again. Do know that they don't eat at all fish or shrimp. They will only try to eat baby fish and shrimp because they only prey on things that they can swallow or fit in their mouths. That's why these guys are great to keep snails in control because they actually eat some few snails once in a while. However, I do have another inhabitant as well, the Pygmy Corridorus catfish. These guys are mostly for the looks and are one of my favorite freshwater nano species, but they actually also do have a purpose. They eat snails and love them. I've often seen mine hunt on the smaller baby snails if they pass by them. To be honest, I don't even know where to put these guys in the food chain because they're different and will not be eaten by any other. So I guess they would be a little over the gobbies, but I'm not completely clarified if they are, but that's where I'd put them. To make sure that some species don't go extinct, this is where a lot of plants plays a huge role for hiding spots. Plants such as Java moss is a great breeding ground for shrimps and snails, and is also a delicious snack for those invertebrates and even gobby fry. They tend to eat the small leaves that are on this type of moss, however not to the extent that it will damage the plant, but they will get good and healthy nutrients from eating fresh live plants. Java moss creates a dense and lushy look which allows for baby shrimps and baby snails to hide and reproduce and they can be attached to driftwood and rocks as well. Awesome, right? Now that is done, we have to understand some of the stuff that is going on in our aquarium or specifically the biology in our aquarium, the microbiology. Here's a brief explanation of what the nitrogen cycle is. 
This is basically the reason that you cycle your tank for one or two weeks before you add your first livestock. And in this microscope you can actually see the beneficial nitrifying bacteria. You can see they're just surfing around, doing their own business, cleaning up, and that's what you want in your aquarium. And it is in all aquariums, it will always be there, and that is what actually makes our aquariums function the way they do. In other words, if these guys wouldn't be there, your fish wouldn't be there either. Here you can see a simple drawing of how the nitrogen cycle actually works. Naturally, we feed our fish. I mean, of course we do. But when your fish are fed, they'll digest it and, you know, do their own business. In other words, they'll poop. A lot. So this lands down on this substrate. This organic matter will be established into ammonia. And at this point, this is where the whole nitrification process actually will begin to happen. Bacteria will eat the ammonia and will make it into ammonium. Then, in a process that is called nitrosonomous, bacteria will eat the ammonium and develop it into nitrites. Then, another type of nitrifying bacteria will make the process that is called nitrospira and convert the nitrites into the final stage of the nitrification process, nitrate. And as you can see on this drawing, the only way you really can get rid of nitrates is either by having a lot of plants that will consume the nitrates or actually doing water changes manually. In fact, no matter what, you have to do water changes because the plants will not be able to consume all the nitrates in your aquarium and they might actually die if you have too much nitrates in your aquarium because algae will just break out like crazy. Again, here's an example of our closed system. We have a closed system and not an open system like a lake, for example, where fresh and new water always comes into the lake. That is very different in an aquarium where it doesn't do that. So, in a nutshell, ammonium and ammonia is very harmful to your fish and invertebrates and can cause serious trouble if the nitrogen cycle is not happening in your tank. Nitrite is a little less harmful and then the least harmful of all of these is nitrate, which still is harmful but not as much. However, your dead organic matter will also create phosphate, which is a great nutrient source for your plants, and so is nitrate, but we don't want to get spikes of these nutrients because that can mean death and serious algae outbreaks. So by doing the regular things we do in our systems occasionally, which is feeding and doing water changes, we can actually establish a system that is all natural with a fully running food chain, which is quite rarely seen these days. You can design your own food chain and try to experiment, but do your research first. I hope this video helped you understand your aquarium a little more in detail and that it showed you some real aquarium science. More videos of aquarium science will come in the future so stay tuned. If you like this video please let me know and thank you guys for watching and see you guys in another video.